Good morning or afternoon. I am Nikki Boyd with SACS Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Before I introduce our moderator, James Simmons, and our speaker, Bridget Joseph, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. If you experience technical difficulties, please use the Tech Support tab, also located on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen if you're using a PC or Command-R if you're using a Mac. Please make sure you are not behind a firewall as this will prevent you from viewing the presentation. Our moderator today is James Simmons. Dr. Simmons is currently a hospitalist nurse practitioner at St. Francis Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. He is a guest lecturer at both the UCLA School of Nursing and the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. He is a clinical ambassador for the CDC's Let's Stop HIV Together campaign and continues to emerge as a leading nationally recognized voice advocating for marginalized communities in healthcare. Dr. Simmons is also frequently featured as a health expert on national television, radio, podcast, and social media program. Dr. Simmons, when you're ready. Thank you, Nikki, for that lovely introduction. Much appreciated. Okay, so the title of today's webinar is Drop Your Mental Load and Pick Up New Innovations for Alarm Fatigue. How fun. And speaking on this very, very timely topic, is an expert in the area, Bridget Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a certified clinical nurse specialist and resuscitation nurse specialist, as well as resuscitation committee chair. She has implemented many quality improvement initiatives and published research to all aspects of resuscitation. She has also previously worked as the director of simulation education. Additionally, she has worked in a variety of fields and specialties as a legal nurse consultant and an interprofessional education consultant. Dr. Joseph has been an invited speaker at numerous medical conferences. Welcome, Dr. Joseph. All right, so our speaker does have the following disclosures for relationships with Stryker, Nuvara, and Relay Response. Okay, so some questions have already come in about this. Of course, this activity is approved for one contact hour, one CE for nurses and respiratory therapists. A link to obtain those CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar, okay? So stick around for that and I'll walk you through how you can get your CE credit. Again, one hour for nurses and respiratory therapists. Of course, again, thank you to Phillips for support for this educational opportunity. And at this time, I will stop yammering. You'll hear more from me at the end. We'll go over Q&A, CE, all that stuff. But for now, I turn it over to you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction, James. Um, and thank you guys all for being here today to listen to me and to, um, to talk a little bit about our mental load uh, as healthcare providers and working through alarm fatigue and the, the impacts that it has. Um, so I do want to just go over the objectives today is that I, you know, I do want to review the, the current state of alarms in, in our healthcare environments that we are uh, inundated with all the time. Um, describe optimal practices in clinical monitoring and alarm management, as well as we're going to go through a case review to look at um, alarm technology and how it can support a decreased mental load for our bedside clinicians. So come along on this lovely journey with me. And, you know, I feel like we hear so much about alarms um, in healthcare, and it's it's kind of like, why do we even care about alarms, right? Um, because alarms really, uh, you know, do so much in our everyday lives. Um, we have alarms at our house, we have alarms, you know, for smoke, fire, carbon monoxide, we have them in our cars, our phones to wake up, um, you know, I also set them when I'm cooking because I forget what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so there's alarms all the time in every aspect of our life. And it does feel like sometimes our brains are ping ponging with alerts and, oh my gosh, what is that even for? Um, I also do that sometimes at home. I'll have an alarm go off for, 
I don't know what. Um, but, you know, we know that at home when our smoke alarm is going off, it's because there's smoke somewhere in our house. We know if the carbon monoxide alarm is going off, open all the windows there's so, and get out of the house, there's carbon monoxide somewhere. Um, so, you know, in those cases, the fire alarm can be, I mean, the uh, fire department can be alerted. So they can come and, you know, do what they need to do to stop the smoke, stop the fire, um, and to, you know, to support us. If our house alarm is going off, the police are gonna be activated because someone might be breaking into our home. Um, you know, and so there's important reasons that we have alarms um, in our daily lives. And, and there's important reasons that we listen to them. We unfortunately do have to wake up in the morning and go to work. So we do have to listen to those alarms as well. Um, even though I know some people are snoozers, but for the most part, we can't snooze and we shouldn't snooze uh, alarms in our lives. Um, so that's why we use them when we're caring for our patients for the exact same reason, right? It's to alert us of some sort of change with our, with our patients. Our patients come to us, they trust us uh, to care for them. And the various devices that we have within the hospital setting, you know, are, are supposed to be doing that. Um, and the alarms and alerts generated by all the, the devices that we use are really intended to warn clinicians um, about a deviation from a, a physiological parameter that we've set. So there's normal physiological parameters that we have, you know, normal that we expect for our patients. And anytime there's a, a large deviation um, and a patient could be harmed, we're alerted to that. So we can do something to intervene. And so you know, that's relatively important, I would say. Um, and that's why, exactly why we care about these alarms. But here's the problem. We all know that we have alarms. We, you know, they're not really the problem, right? We know that we need to respond to alarms, but the problem is these non-actionable alarms. Um, and those are alarm signals that are triggered by a ton of different reasons, right? Some of them are clinical and some of them are non-clinical. Um, and high numbers of these, you know, non-actionable alarms, um, you know, that are, that are false, will be like, oh, it's a fake alarm. Oh, it's false. Don't worry about it. Um, so we might silence them or we might ignore them and just kind of walk by them. But all of those alarms, or if you hear a low level, like, yeah, I'll check it eventually, those are the alarms that start to lead to um, alarm fatigue for us. Our brain just gets overwhelmed with the noises and the sounds, and we're just like, ugh, shutting it down. We're not gonna, we can't even hear it anymore. Um, and so a false alarm is really defined as an alarm sound that occurs when no valid triggering um, event has taken place for the patient um, or equipment. So you know, it could be something like poor um, electro to skin contact. So if we just have an old um, telemetry uh, um, electrode on our patient's skin and it's not feeling, it can't get a, a heart rate, it's gonna alarm off. Um, and a true positive alarm condition is when there's a valid triggering event. And those are the ones that are really important, right? Um, so we want to make sure that there's the right alarms are helping are going off at the right time. And a non-actionable, just to kind of double down a little bit more, a, a non-actionable alarm is also defined as a true alarm that's correctly sounding based on how the, the default parameters are set for our patient, but for an event that has no clinical relevance, right? Um, and it, it requires no intervention. Um, and that's an example of, you know, uh, our patient has a, you know, we have a COPD or that we're not going to give a large amounts of um, oxygen to, uh, you know, because we don't want to kill their, their O2, uh, their respiratory trigger, right? So, but they're, they're riding at the 90s. They're, they've got something going on in their lungs. So their, their O2 sats are in the 90s. Um, but our alarm goes off at 92 because that's just what it's set at at our hospital. So they're constantly ringing off. Well, there's, you know, yes, that would be valid. If my O2 sat was 90, that's not great. I should be ringing off. You should be running in and, and assessing me. But for somebody that that's their baseline, we need to change the alarm. Because that's not, that's not scary for them. That's where they live. Um, you know, so we really need to, you know, as a whole, think about what's, you know, what are the causes of these false and non-actionable alarm signals and start to 
systematically address the causes and how they can have a, a how we can have alarms have a positive impact on our patients again and positively impact patient safety. Um, you know, because some of the more common causes of false and non actionable alarms um, are the ones uh, on your screen here. So, you know, that electrode placement, if we have electrodes in the wrong place, they're not picking up what they need to, they're not picking up the correct heart rhythm. Um, or, you know, if it's an electrode, you know, on the finger for an SpO2, you know, if we have a a nose probe on the finger, that's not, that's not helpful. Um, if we're not doing proper preparation of the skin for our electrodes, they're not going to adhere as well. So they're going to fall off. They're not going to um, give us the response that we need. Um, if there's like broken electrodes, that's not helpful. If we're not doing electrode changes um, as frequently as we should be, because we, you know, there are some best practices out there that help to reduce these alarms. We need to make sure that we're adhering to them. And then if there's anything actually wrong with the um, with the wires of the telemetry, if you see something that looks like it's not working, let's not use that one. That's why we have clinical engineering, you know, everywhere that we work to to give them, you know, the opportunity to, to fix the things that are not working for us. So I wanted to just, you know, think about some of the just some of the alarms that we hear in the in the hospital and clinic setting, um, and not even including, you know, our pages, um, you know, if you were a pager or the the phone calls that we're getting, if you're given, you know, some sort of a, a phone device um, or your personal phones, the overhead um, alerts that we might hear, the alert emergency alarms that are on the unit, um, doorbells. Um, I feel like the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and I know I can't see anybody's hands, um, but I'm sure there's some of you who have had the same experiences as me, which is having so many alarms on an overnight shift that you go home and go to bed and you hear those alarms in your sleep. Um, and I'd love to say that we're, we're dreaming about how much we love work, um, but really we're absolutely having nightmares um, about the alarms that we're getting um, hammered with at, at work um, and alarms that are you know, occurring in our workplace um, and, and that are negatively impactful on our mental state, right? So the alarms that are, that are occurring can really affect staffing, um, our workflow, our processes, um, you know, how we manage um, alarms, and then it can really have an, um, an immediate impact on patient care. Um, you know, there are many times that I have seen, um, you know, staff walk by a room being like, oh yeah, it's just, yeah, that, that person's always alarming. Well, they are, but one of those times could be a time that there's actually something really bad happening and we're just not listening to that alarm because they're always going off. So we need to think about all of these things, you know, our pulse oxes, the vents, the capnography devices, you know, all the tele, the central monitors, the bedside monitors, our 12 leads, um, you know, all of the, the vital sign machines, our infusion pumps, holy moly, with the bent arms and the IVs, um, any sort of wearable devices, our beds even make alarms chair alarms. There's so many that we are constantly hearing while we're at work. And so this can lead to something, um, you know, called alarm flood. And I don't know if you guys have, have heard about this term, um, but an alarm flood um, is, is a condition where there's 10 or more alarms in 10 minutes. So that's more alerting than the human brain can actually be expected expected to respond to effectively. I mean, we do, right? We're, we're healthcare providers, we're nurses, we're respiratory therapists. We, we do what needs to be done and we, we get it done and we do it in style, right? But that's more than our brains are meant to be able to, to handle at one time. And um, you know, this happens, and I would say more than just sometimes, I would say that this happens frequency, ten, with, with frequency, 10 alarms in 10 minutes. Um, and you know, not, it doesn't happen on all units. It doesn't happen every single day, but it happens. Um, and the expectation of, you know, of us as healthcare providers is that we're reacting quickly and we're supporting our patients' conditions. So the frustration is when <laughs> for us, and I think for our brains is when we're, we're, we're alerted and we're reacting quickly, but there's nothing, there's no condition to manage. There's no intervention. There's nothing to do with um, for our patient to decrease that um, 
alarm. So this alarm flooding, um, the the excessive noises, the all of this all of this extraneous stuff that is that is happening in our heads on top of all the things that we have to do right to take care of our patients um it creates a sensory chaos um for us and amidst the sensory chaos it's it's really it is tough to imagine how a nurse how a respiratory therapist of you know any other healthcare provider in the hospital or clinic setting can manage the alerts from just one patient right like let alone five six you know seven patients or more in in some wards um and there are so many false alarms that people just go and click okay 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 to just kind of silence the the um for lack of a better term, the assault of alarms. And in that, some real alarms can get lost. Um, so we can miss important things because we're just clicking it to just be like, silence, I need a second. Um, and because it, it does get overwhelming, you know, and especially for, you know, there are many healthcare providers um, that are neurodivergent, um, that have the, you know, ADHD or, or other neurodivergencies, and that sensory overload can really throw their brains out of whack. Um, and there was actually um, an observational study um, at uh, University of California, San Francisco, UCSF a few years ago, um, and they had a researcher go um, to, you know, observe nurses and how they interact with their central um, uh, telemetry system um, and, and their central monitor stations within the unit. And so they just kind of, you know, stood there and, and watched as the, as the nurses and other healthcare providers came up to that, that centralized area and what they did and clicked and alarms and yada, yada. So they watched the nurses press the, the silence button like over and over and over. And when the researcher, um, you know, asked what alarm they just silenced, they'd say, uh, I, I don't remember. I don't know. And, you know, the nurses, what they kind of derived is that the nurses' minds were so used to these alarms that they barely registered what they'd even just done. They were so used to just clicking OK and like ending the silence or ending the noise um, that they didn't even know what they clicked. They're just like, all right, I got to end that noise. Um, and so from that from that research, they found that approximately there's eight in 10 clinicians report um, and this is all healthcare uh, providers, but um, eight and 10 clinicians report disabling an actionable alarm at least once. So because we're just, we've trained ourselves to just hear the noise, click okay, hear the noise, click okay, we're not actually like absorbing what we're clicking okay to. Um, we're just, all right, got it. Um, so, and our brains are, you know, pretty amazing things, right? Um, and they can essentially trick ourselves. We trick ourselves into to as a way of self-preservation. Um, and so that's, you know, our brain is like, great, this is the behavior that we need to do to, to make that noise go away so that I'm not gonna lose it. Um, but in that, we're losing the whole point of an alarm. We're losing the whole point of an alert. So I do have a polling question for you guys, just to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, and I want to ask you about this, um, this rectangle of lines and shapes that you see here. Um, and I, I promise it'll make sense on the, on the other side. I promise. Um, so it's not as random as you think. But there should be a polling question on the, um, on the right side of your screen. Um, lower right hand side, I believe. Um, and so it is... Um, I'm going to just show up uh, some of your responses here, um, but uh, we're going to go through this and um, uh, and and see what the what your responses are. And I'm kind of excited about this. Um, so I'll give you guys a few minutes, uh, or not a few minutes, <laughs> a few more seconds to answer. I'll just sit and stare at you for a while. Um, but so the answers, the, the polling question is just for those of you I know are having some technical issues, but um, looking at the rectangle on the screen, um, I see lines that are A, completely crooked, B, about to intersect, C, parallel, or D, making my brain completely twitch. Um, and just, you know, as a little teaser, it makes my brain completely twitch and it makes me very uncomfortable to actually look at it. <laughs> just for all of you guys out there. Um, 
All right. So I think that we are just about, we've got quite a few answers in here. So I think we're going to just about call it. Okay. So let's see here. So we have about 29% uh, of you guys see that it's completely crooked. 18% uh, to say that it's um, about to intersect. 38% say it's parallel and uh, 15 are, are with me making their, um, making their brains twitch. So, um, so I wanted to, to ask you guys about this and, and kind of show it quickly um, because this is called um, the Zollner illusion, optical illusion. Um, and it's, and I wanted to bring it up and um, because it's an example of our, our mental adaptation. So amidst the chaos, and it's different because this is visual, um, but I didn't want to blare sirens at you guys um, when we're talking about, you know, the mental load and the impact of, of alarm fatigue um, or alarms on our brain. Um, but uh, <laughs> But I wanted to show you guys this this Zollner um, illusion because our, our brain does, as I said, our brain can kind of uh, trick us and it, our brain can adapt to a lot of things um, and it can handle a lot amidst all the chaos that we are, you know, that we are um, a part of in the in the hospital setting. So, you know, a large percentage of you guys said that it was crooked or it made your brain hurt. Um, um, and it is really intended to um, to tickle your brain. Um, so feel okay if your brain feels feels wild looking at it. Um, but basically our brains somehow expand all of these acute angles formed where those hatch marks are um, and they meet these long parallel lines. But our brain actually doesn't let, for, for most people, and I know that a good majority of you guys did say that they're parallel, um, but because of those hatch marks, our brain doesn't always let us see those parallel lines. Um, and that is part of the way uh, brains work differently. And I, I admittedly am neurodivergent, so it's more probably active in my brain. Um, but um, those hatch marks are intended to actually offset our eyes so that we see something different than is actually there. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's because of this phenomenon in our visual processing center of our brain. It's called lateral inhibition. And um, the idea basically is that some of the neurons in, in that part of your brain um, specifically respond to lines that are oriented in different directions. And when one of the neurons is turned on, it turns off the activity of all the neighbors. So you're more looking at the hash marks than you are the parallel lines. So this response, this, this visualization is, is a little bit of visual chaos. So imagine our, our brains with this auditory overload, um, which, you know, by the way, you know, uh, auditory chaos and auditory assault has been used by you know militaries for um as a type of torture for years right and that's in our our work setting so how fun is that um so moving right along um you know i want to do i do want to talk about you know alarms as kind of an auditory uh a journey here because there are so many different types of alarms that we're supposed to hear when we're within the unit um or within the you know the clinical setting um and so i'm and i'm speaking just in generalities here about sounds and types of alarms and really and you know an advisory um is you know kind of intermittent single beeps it's intended to be like a, a one level up uh, just a little bit of an alarm um you know just to advise you that something's happening is that super important is it not i don't know um <laughs> It's just an advisory. Um, and then there are, you know, warnings um, that are more of spaced out double beeps. Um, and so that's more of like, it's supposed to perk you up a little bit more, right? Um, and then there are these crisis alerts. And these are, you know, some of the highest levels, um, which are strings of these ear piercing beep, beep, beep tones um, that will not stop until, um, someone actively silences them. Um, so advisories can kind of sometimes go on and linger. Warnings will sometimes go on and linger. Um, sometimes they will shut off after a certain amount of time. But the, the crisis alarms, those are those really high level alarms that someone has to, to, to turn them off. And in a typical, and I'm just using a critical care ward um, for purposes of 
you know, a, a study that I found. And in one of the critical care wards, um, there was a, another study that was done and it reported that there was anywhere from 150 to 400 of these alarms um, that could sound on every patient every day. Um, so in a 10 bed ICU, which is a relatively small ICU, right? That's 4,000 alarms every single shift. Eek. Um, and that's enough to drive anyone basically um, insane. Um, and approximately 90% of those are nuisance alarms. So they're either false or clinically irrelevant. We're not going to do anything about that. And I know in critical care, our patients are, you know, can tend to be a little bit sicker. Um, so they may have some more, um, you know, there may be an expectation that there's more alarms for those patients um, because they are, you know, critically ill. But that's 4,000 alarms in one shift it is a lot. Um, so what is happening actually in our brains when this when this happens um that we have all of these alarms we're basically being assaulted by noise and alarms um but we have to go on you know with our day we have to do what's best for our patients we still have to respond in some way or another um and we you know we go back at it day after day um you know and and responding as such and so when healthcare providers um essentially become desensitized um, to these false alarms. It's something known as the, the cry wolf effect. Um, and it's, it is more likely to occur um, during periods of, of high workload, which I would say in healthcare is uh, every day, right? That we always have a heavy workload. We are always gonna have you know, some patient that some sort of uh, alarm is going on. But the, the cry wolf effect um, is pretty interesting in, in how it works on our brain because um, when we get overstimulated, we then are desensitized. So there's so many alarms going off that we don't respond to them. And now we have become distrustful um, so you can tend to distrust or mistrust um, the alerts that are coming from patients and also ignore, there's a possibility, a higher possibility that you're going to ignore any subsequent alarms um, from the same or similar device. So that's a problem when it's happening from like telemetry or, you know, oxygen saturations or, you know, basically anything, uh, even, you know, chair alarms. I mean, all of those things are really crucial to keeping our patients safe and, and, and the work that we do every day. Um, so when we start to not trust them and be like, oh, it's a fake alarm. If one out of 1000 times <laughs> that thing is real, we're in trouble. We should be, you know, responding to that, but we also can't be expected to respond to 400 patients. Uh, I mean, 400 alarms on every single one of our patients every day. So basically our brains are overstimulated and they we respond by desensitizing all of these alarms and our responses. It shuts down, um, our brain just shuts down to the constant irritation and the constant chaos. Um, our bodies love a state of equilibrium, basically with everything. You know, every everything that we do to our bodies, it wants to get back to its equilibrium state, right? And so, what our bodies are doing when we have all these assaults of alarms on our ears is that it tries to adapt to get us back to an equilibrium, to a point where our ears and our brains are not irritated by all of this noise. So then we want to think about, you know, what really, what really is happening here. And so while alarm fatigue is an overt sensory challenge um, in healthcare, um, we're all prone to um, impaired judgments when we when we push our brains um, normal processing to extreme limits, right? And that you know that happens a lot. Um, and for those of you guys who are on here and and who worked during um, uh, during the pandemic, that was definitely a time that I think we we really pushed our brains to to the max. We pushed our bodies, our brains. We pushed everything, um, and that does impair our judgment and our brain's ability to to get the right thing going. Um, what is the best choice right now? It cannot decide. <laughs> we cannot trust our own brains. But um, there was a, um, a research study that was done at Brigham Young University. 
Um, and they expose staff to dozens and dozens and dozens of alerts and warnings um, on, on digital screens over a five day period. So they just kept hammering them with different low level, high level, all these different alarms. And, and during this time, they were not working clinically. They were just doing it for fun. <laughs> they all knew they were part of the research. But they scanned, during the time that they were, they were giving them all these alarms, they scanned their brain. So they did a, an MRI once a day. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a huge surprise, right? But the right and left um, insular regions of the, of the brain um, are centers of attention. Um, displayed discre uh, decreasing levels of activation um, as the study went on. So day by day, that center of attention in you know in our um, in our brains, so the the insular regions were less and less responsive and effective. So basically, the more alarms they saw, the less response our brain was giving it. And that's important because this is something that we've been dealing with for years that I feel like healthcare providers have been talking about for years and that we've been, you know, saying is a, it has been a problem for us. And this muted response of our brains, and especially in this study, really shows that the participants' um, brains were habituating or, or, or adapting um, to these warnings. Um, so they were directing less focused attention to them over time. And while this isn't, you know, an exact science, um, you know, it most likely is happening because the brain adapts to this constant alarm by setting the bar for the response higher. Um, you know, and it makes sense. Um, it's the same way our um, you know, increase their tolerance to, you know, we see patients with such a high tolerance to, to certain drugs um, to get, you know, the effect that they want um, because they've been, you know, whether it's a street drug or whatever or something that we prescribe them, but they can't get the same effect because they've been taking the same medication for so long that the effect isn't uh, what was desired by the, by the patient. It's because their tolerance has increased um, because they're constantly taking it. Um, and this is that's concerning um, when you know we're talking about patients, patient safety, and the the intended impact of these alarms. So really, you know, whilst we find these alarms really you know annoying, right? Um, when you're working and they're constantly going off, that they're pretty annoying, or you don't you you've gotten to the point that you're numb and you don't even notice them. The other, the flip side is, is the patient's perspective and they find them even tenfold <laughs> more annoying than we do. Um, we're used to them, um, you know, and, and so our brain's kind of like, eh, you know, as I said, we can kind of ignore them, right? Sometimes, like, even if we're not intentionally trying to, our brain's like, yeah, we're not going to hear that. Um, <clears throat> but patients, it drives them berserk um, because they're not used to that noise assault. And the, they, they also feel that there is something wrong and we're not doing anything. When they're hearing those alarms, for them, it's like, oh my gosh, there's an alarm. Like someone should be turning it off. There needs to be a response to it. Someone's sick and hurt and nothing, no one's doing anything about it. It's just going off. We're, no one's treating them. And then they start to get anxious about, oh my gosh, do, uh, are they not treating me? Is that me? Am I dying? Uh, is something really bad happening to me? Are they not going to respond to me if I if I start alarming? Um, and so it, it, it's a concern. And especially when we're looking at, you know, patient surveys and um, patient experience responses with Press Ganey and, and hospitals are, you know, hospitals need to to they need as many reimbursements as they can get. And you know, there's a lot of reimbursement and a lot of money on the table tied to patient experience. And it's something that's very, uh, very difficult to talk about setting the bar high. That's something that's very difficult to raise the bar um, to get, you know, positive patient feedback and alarms on the unit are one of the things that come back as something that patients, it's a huge dissatisfier. Um, and that's money that we're all, you know, that hospitals are kind of leaving on the table because it's not being addressed systemically. That's just kind of one aspect. Um, but there was also a study um, done in Korea in 2020, and they were looking at identifying the, um, the impact of, of 
uh, nurses' perception of clinical alarms and um, patient safety culture on, on alarm management, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. And there were 116 nurses that were working in this. Um, it was a, a tertiary acute care hospital. Um, and they all had to complete, of these 116 nurses, they all completed a, a self-reported uh, questionnaire about a ton of different topics. Um, but it included general characteristics and um, you know, clinical alarm issues, um, nurses' alarm per perception, um, patient safety culture, um, and alarm management practices um, that they used. Um, and the you know the the mean age of the the staff there were about 28 um, years old, and they had been working for anywhere from um, five to nine years, um, and they found that the importance of alarm issues, um, including you know, frequent false alarms leading to reduced attention or, or response, so this alarm fatigue that we're talking about, um, was the most important issue identified um, in these questionnaires um, out of all the feedback. And it was, it, you know, they basically derived that a higher level of, of nurses perceived patient safety culture was the biggest predictor um, of better alarm management practice, meaning that if a nurse found alarm management important, then it was managed better because they took control of it and they managed it for their patient. They would change the uh, you know alarm parameters, they would change the settings. Um, and then followed by their their perception of clinical um, clinical alarm need. So if they thought that they needed to you know manage those those um, alarm parameters, then on top of that, they would make sure that they were responding to clinical alarms every time. And the other thing that I found was really interesting from this study was that <clears throat> that female nurses, and I'm not throwing any shade at any other gender, um, but female, those identifying as female nurses um, and, and charge nurses and then nurses who worked less than 40 hours a week, so mostly those part-timers, um, were more likely to work better in alarm management practice. So they responded faster to alarms and managed parameters better for their um for their patients now we don't necessarily you know it was you know a relatively small study and it would be interesting to to look at and and delve deeper and, and get something you know um outside within the us to kind of do a comparative just me being us centric here and working here um but it would be interesting to kind of look and, and see at that comparison here um but i did find it interesting that you know those who worked less um taking out gender and anything else but those who worked less um and maybe because they weren't exposed so much to those alarms tended to respond faster and it was because they most likely, and this is a, you know, a Bridgetism, but what I'm pulling is that they weren't um, getting the alarm um, assault so much, so they were responding faster. They weren't having that alarm fatigue. So why is this all so important? Um, well, because <laughs> because we are here to help our patients um, and we assist patients. And, um, and it is really important because the world, um, the world Health Organization, WHO, um, estimates that a, a projected shortage of 15 million healthcare workers will be present by 2030. So in seven years that we're gonna be short 15 million healthcare workers. Um, and as the clinician to patient ratio increases, and I'm not saying it should, but I'm just saying, um, there, it's, increasingly difficult to provide the level of care that patients expect. We know that patients expect, you know, the four seasons when they walk into a hospital, right? Um, they're coming into a community hospital and expecting the world. Um, but never mind going to like a larger city hospital and, you know, an academic medical center. And, you know, that's why we get these poor ratings for, for patient experience. Um, so it's a constant uphill battle for us. But these, these factors kind of add stress to an already um, high pressure acute care environment. Um, you know, we're expected to have more patients, less support, um, and, you know, and also manage all of these 
alarms and, and have positive patient outcomes. So basically the current pulse um, of the, of the, you know, of the, oh, I skipped a slide. My apologies. Eek, I got crazy. Um, but basically, you know, the current pulse is that we're, we're stressed out. We're overwhelmed. We feel undersupported already. So I can't imagine that going even further. Um, and it's not surprising that, a, that there was a study of more than 9,500 nurses found that 75% um, had felt stressed about and 62% had felt overwhelmed while they were at work. And among those um, healthcare providers that were uh, nurses that were surveyed, um, they all said that they were intended, they intended to leave their, um, their position within six months because of that stress and feeling so overwhelmed. And every unit feels understaffed, right? I, I don't think there's any, um, one of my healthcare provider friends and when I'm at conferences, no one says like, oh yeah, we're great. We always have enough staff. Um, this leads to a pulse of profession that doesn't feel great. You know, we have a great profession and um, we have had a great profession. Um, but right now, healthcare providers, we don't feel good. We're fried, we're burned out. Um, and burnout can be caused by so many different factors, which we all face all the time. Um, increased workload, inadequate support, whether it's real or perceived, um, a lack of control or feeling of autonomy when we're at work, a stressful environment, a loud environment, um, you know, moral injury um, from the, you know, feeling like we are unable to meet the needs of our patients and the demands that they have and the demands of the hospitals and policies and documenting and so much and there's research out there that reinforces that that our that as healthcare providers we score really high on a, on a burnout assessment um and you know we have been for about the last three years that any of us if we do if we went to do a professional burnout assessment score with a psychologist we would all be up there um and so for anyone doing the math or anyone who's been in healthcare for a minute you know, the the pandemic started in, in 2020. We just had our three year anniversary of, of it basically kind of hitting the hitting the wall as it were. And I know that there's a lot of healthcare providers that are still not over those feelings of stress and feeling overwhelmed that started back then. Um, and quite honestly, feeling like they they don't meet the mark um, with with current patient needs. Um, so just to kind of you know double down a little bit, um, and I'm we're burned out. Um, we need to talk about it. We need to acknowledge it. We need to realize that this is a reality for some of us or or for some of our colleagues. And burnout can be tricky. Um, it can be something that you don't recognize that you're in the thick of it until someone maybe tells you and you get mad at them. Um, and or you get hit over the head with it. Um, but we work in these high stress professions, um, good days, bad days, you know, there's ups and downs. But, you know, it does feel like uh, constant alarms and all of this chaos where we work, it doesn't make it any better. Um, and in fact, it makes it worse. So just looking up here at these, at these um, symptoms, the exhaustion, the depersonalization, the lack of efficiency, these are all things that you know we can feel when we're when we're at work. Then, you know, everyone's tired. We work long shifts. You know, we used to feel camaraderie about it, but we don't necessarily anymore. And that's where it's leading to a, to a problem. Um, and when we become the, the that last uh, portion there, that lack of efficiency, that's where you know, we can make mistakes because we start to, to depersonalize um, what we're doing. So we're not emotionally available for our patients or anyone else. We're just tapped. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it becomes a problem because we start making mistakes because we're not finding value in what we're doing. Um, and that's not okay for our patients. And it's not, it's more so not okay for us. So how do we fix us? We need support, we need to be heard. We all need to be kind to one another for starters. Um, but adequate staffing levels and flexible work schedules are, are really gonna be influential in reducing our workload. You know, realistic workload expectations with appropriate resources and training um, 
are absolutely crucial in helping with this burnout um, and increasing our engagement, peer support and providing access to, to supports within the hospital setting, um, which most of us have, are great. But also adhering to these best practices. And sometimes we get a little confused, you know, it's like, oh, we need more education, how to make the hospital quieter. No, we don't. You know, education, we know what we need to do. It's being able to have the time to do it. Um, but it is really important um, to make sure that our, you know, that we're doing, taking these right steps, that we're doing the right skin prep for our patients, that because if we're not doing the right skin prep and our leads are not in the right place, we're going to get erroneous alarms. We're going to get false alarms. We're going to get um, missing patients underlying rhythm of, um, and assuming it's a lead placement issue. Um, you know, we know that a large majority of these of these alarms are, are inaccurate. So let's make sure that we're doing what we need to do. Um, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, body hair is clipped, that we're drawing off, you know, uh, sweaty skin, we're replacing the leads every day, you know, every 24 hours, um, and really personalizing parameters for each patient. And, and that's one that I kind of want to uh, dig into a little bit is these um, personalized care for our patients, because we need to create, you know, a standard for individualization for our patients um, and, and move away from the current state of this like ad hoc management um, of, of patient alarms, where we respond to like change parameters, but we don't have time to change parameters, look at every patient and, you know, we need to move to an, uh, a future state where there's an intelligent data-driven alarm, man alarm management for our patients um, and a, an alarm management system of care essentially for our patients. So because if we personalize the care for our patients, we can lower those false alarms for our patients. Um, I'm not going to have the same data points as one of you guys out there. Um, and it may seem, you know, on paper, like we might look alike, um, but I'm an individual, my body works its own way. Your body works its own way. Our data is gonna look different. So I should be treated according to my baseline and how my body works and go from there. And that's what we should do for alarms is make them meaningful to us. It will make them trustworthy again. And it'll bring us to a point that, um, that an alert and alarm actually will get a response from us and we will be able to treat it because we know if we hear an alarm we've got to do something it's like me being the fireman responding to a fire alarm i've got it um so as i'm talking about that i'm sure some of you are thinking yeah great good idea how do we get there well I want to tell you the the future is here. It's here. So we have good news. We've been heard. Um, you know, uh, medical devices have heard us, and I've I've heard people. Um, there are patient monitoring devices out there that can actually help us take off some of this mental burden and mental load, and support us in taking care of our patients. And they can help us meet those practices like individual alarm care. And the new technology is so intelligent that it tracks our patients' trends and it'll tell us when they're, that there are, um, how we can get fewer alerts for our patients um, and make suggestions for changes in alarm parameters and see through the data that our patients are giving us. Um, it can help see through you know, a couple of alarms to really give us what we need. So while we're taking care of our patients, giving them meds, listening to them, educating them on their disease process, speaking with the family, um, you know, suctioning, supporting, you know, procedures, all these other things. Sometimes that fire you need to do the right thing is AI, <laughs> some sort of artificial intelligence saying there's a change in trends that you've been missing on your patient. And that is already, that is here. Um, and that is, that is with us right now. Oh, and I'm going to switch my slide and I know I'm getting tight on time. So I'm going to talk really fast. Um, so we want to individualize our patient's alarms and we know it's the right thing to do, but we don't always have the time, right? We don't have that mental capacity. So as our patient's conditions change over time, um, we hope, or that we hope they get better, right? Um, but very often alarm settings will, will stay. So they're not in sync with the patient's current state of health. And that's what we, that's how we get those non-actionable alarms. We silence, we miss early deterioration symptoms of our patients. But these intelligent um, devices will now give us some gentle alerts that we've, um, that we've shut off alarm for our patients. And there's a, there's a trend that we may be missing. So it encourages us to go look at our patient and acknowledge 
and say, hey, maybe we should be um, adjusting that alarm. So how does it work? Um, there's, uh, there are alerts that can tell you, hey, you've silenced this alarm at least five times um, in, in the last 60 minutes. Um, it'll alert you to check on the patient and if they're healthy, stable, they're doing well, great. Uh, then consider adjusting that alarm. There's data algorithms that are being run on your, on your patients on their personal data and letting us know that we're silencing it without even putting any brain power into it. Let's change that. Let's not get that alert anymore because we don't need it. And that's going to help decrease your mental load more than, you know, and what's better than, um, you know, than a suggestion that actually solves a problem. I love a good suggestion that solves a problem. Um, and it, you know, you, I think it's lovely that it just gently tells you, you silence this alarm quite a few times. Don't know if you knew you did, but you did. Um, so please think about adjusting it. Um, and then there's, you know, some monitoring assistance. Um, and this is something that, you know, can be a source of stress when we're not in our patient's room, when we're in a different room, when we're hearing alarms going off. Oh my gosh, is it my patient? Um, you know, you're wondering if if that's the one you've been worried about, but now you can see the rhythms on, on a mobile device. So I can see live rhythms. And if I can't get out of that room and go see my patient, I can flip it off to a buddy. I can push it that alarm to, to you know, Sarah, who's watching my other patients while I'm stuck in this procedure. I can also rerun a blood pressure if the blood pressure looks off. Um, so I can help to, to really support accountability for my patient and accountability for these alarms without um, without having to, to run somewhere. Um, so we have this, what a huge burden removed, right? You can be in another patient's room and quickly look and be like, oh my gosh, that's false. Or, oh my gosh, I really got to go for it. Um, and I got to get out of here. Or I can send somebody else to, to look at it. You can have a buddy system. How great is that? Um, and then I know I'm going over. Um, how long does this, uh, how does this work, this supportive surveillance? You know, it's this is actually a very cool um, endeavor. And it's an awesome way that technology can support us, especially when we're worried we're missing something because we're not at our freshest mentally because we're stressed out. We've got a lot going on. Um, but basically, you know, uh, our, there is internal analyzation of our patients and all of the data that they have. So one of your patients, you can choose up to four parameters. Um, they will be analyzed together. And based on a patient's presenting condition and concerns of care, um, instead of each alarm going off separately as possible nuisance alarms, which we silence or miss a trend, it will alert us that there, there is one alert that there is a change in these trends and these changes are happening all together. And that's a meaningful alarm. That's something that's actionable because that's something that I'm going to have a discussion. I can intervene upon. I can communicate with the team and I can perhaps prevent further deterioration. So I do want to just quickly um, review cases. I know I have like a minute left and I'm, I'm just ramming through this here. But I wanted to show you guys um, a case that... Um, that I uh, was um, a part of, right? And so there was a patient and he was paced um, and he came in and the providers, you know, fine, that's the baseline, number one. Number two, they started to get a few alerts, but they, it was just silence, silence. Oh, that's just, you know, he's doing something. Oh, no, that's not real. That's not a real alarm. They weren't trusting it, so they were silencing it. And then this third alarm was shortly thereafter when the patient went into a run of VTAC. They went into torsades. Um, and if the if the clinicians had trusted the alerts and they had not just ignored them and, and silenced them, we could have prevented um, possibly this torsades from occurring. And for this patient needing to be shocked and going to the ICU and everything else. And so I want you to kind of think about if this has ever happened to you, do you think that there's ever, you know, a patient situation that you may have missed? Um, and also, you know, if you, that has never happened to you, kudos, you're amazing. <laughs> but I definitely have patients, I'm like, shoot, did I miss something? Um, and, you know, would these technologies be helpful for you? Um, and then if you're able and you are lucky enough to get these technologies in here, because they are out there, um, you know, just make sure it's 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 working. And the best way to do that is to monitor the noise, monitor the feedback of staff, review the data. Have we been missing anything? 
talk about it on safety huddles, do clinical reviews of our patients. Um, and more so just check and see if we're meeting the mark for our patients. I mean, for our staff, because we're gonna have less burnout, we're gonna have fewer alarms on the unit and we're gonna have better patient care. So I appreciate all of you guys. I jammed through the end of this. Um, if you have any questions or any further, you can reach out. This is my contact information here and I'm gonna um, pass it off to James so how you can get your uh, CEs for today. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Um, wow, <laughs> so much of that hit home uh, in both the good and the bad ways. I was literally going through, I was like, how many alarms have I muted too many times? And then your case review scared, uh, scared me. Um, maybe that was your point. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. I know we're a little tight on time, so I wanna make sure that everyone can see this because I promised you we would get to it. All right, so everything that Dr. Joseph just reviewed is good for one, hour of continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists, okay? One contact hour, there's that slide up there, you can see where to go. Uh, you wanna, to obtain that CE credit, you're gonna go to saxtesting.com slash BO, and I left out the www, but you should not. www is important here, dot saxtesting.com slash BO, boy, Oscar. You will need to register at that site, complete the evaluation, and then once you're done with the evaluation, you can print your certificate of completion, okay? Uh, and again, of course, thank you to Phillips for your educational support of this activity. Okay, also, there's gonna be an archive version of this, um, so you can uh, go check it out afterwards, or folks who are not able to attend live in person can also go check it out. It is available at www.better-outcomes.org. And that's a dash, it's not the word dash spelled out. www.better-outcomes.org. Uh, an email to those of you who registered are gonna be sent when that archive version is available. And good news, the archive slash on-demand version is available for that one contact hour, again, for nurses and RTs. Uh, okay, so Dr. Joseph, some questions. I, you have several. Um, I really like this question. I'm gonna give you a chance. Man, there's so much we could talk about, but uh, we do have a question here. What are your thoughts on wearables for caregivers that can provide haptics or tactile stimuli as opposed to using audible or visual alarms? So I think that um, I think it's good as like a let's switch it up kind of thing, but you're going to also get numb to that. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have like an Apple Watch or, you know, my things are always on silent in my world. I think the noise, um, but everything's always on silent. But I tend to not feel things anymore. I don't feel my if my phone's in my pocket and it's, you know, it's buzzing um, without making a noise. I don't feel it. I sometimes don't even feel my Apple Watch buzzing to alert me of, of something um, because I'm so used to it. And I, I used to have flood, you know, overload on my Apple Watch that it was constantly getting emails and stuff. And I finally shut that off. Um, so I think that I think it's good to have different um, alert uh, capabilities. Um, because you know somebody might be responsive to one thing that they're not to another, uh, but I do worry about having too much overload on our body in in one certain way. So I think anything, if it's too much and we're not responding to it and it's not actually alerting us in a, a positive way, we're going to become immune to it eventually. Just mm -hmm. my thoughts. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, this is the, I feel like we're at the end of a TV show here where I'm like, before we go to commercial break, you have 20 seconds. Um, but I do love this commercial, <laughs> just a uh, commercial, ah, this question, just your overall thoughts um, about empowering people to be a little bit more on top of maybe changing those, those little things that you mentioned, changing alarm settings, um, making it a habit in your morning workflow, that sort of thing. Like, Rather, this person asked if you th think a, a physician or provider order is necessary for that, um, but you're just sort of your, in the last 15 seconds here, your top line thoughts. So I will say that most hospitals and clinics, it, they require a physician order to uh, to change parameters, set parameters. So, so I can't speak to whatever your institution has. However, I do think it's important to 
like build into your workflow that every like two minutes or two minutes, every two to three hours that you're going and looking at alarms that went off um, so that you can actually look and see, hey, did I miss something actionable? And if no, and I've just been shutting off a ton of unactionable alarms, maybe it is time to like switch this down and have a quick conversation with the provider and just say, listen, this is their baseline. I'm turning down the alarm parameter until they change and get better, this is where we're gonna keep it. Um, and just feel empowered to do that. You do have the capability to do that as a nurse and, and to feel autonomous in, in doing that. We just need to make sure that our providers support us and, and you know understand the reasoning that we wanna change those alarms and just get that order from them to, to reinforce um, what you actually did. Um, but I think it's really important to work it into your everyday workflow. Every two to three hours, just go and look what you silenced. We obviously don't remember two seconds afterwards. So um, it's a tough topic and I could obviously talk about it for hours. Right, we could, we could go on for a long time. Uh, just a quick thank you to you, Dr. Joseph. Um, for a really, really awesome presentation um, and everyone for attending um, as well. And Nikki, I will hand it over to you now. Thank you. This concludes the webinar for today. I would like to remind the audience there is a survey for you at the conclusion that will pop up immediately. We would greatly appreciate your opinions on today's webinar. CE Certificate of Completion. In one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and the link to obtain your CE credits. Nurses and RTs, www.sacstesting.com slash BO. Thank you again on behalf of our presenter, Sachs Healthcare Communications, and our sponsor, Philips. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.